As Turkey pulls out of an international treaty protecting women's rights, we ask renowned author Elif Shafek what this means for gender-based violence. But first, protests and strikes continue unabated against the military coup in Myanmar. Hundreds have been killed and thousands arrested as the junta doubles down on its brutal repression. So what's next for Myanmar? We'll ask the international envoy for Aung San Suu Kyi's ousted civilian government. This week's headliner, Dr. Sasa. Dr. Sasa, thank you so much for joining me on Upfront. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, the crackdown on dissent uh, since the military coup last month in Myanmar has been brutal. Uh, more than 2,500 people have been arrested. According to activists, uh, over 250 people have been killed by security forces. The leader of your party, Aung San Suu Kyi, has been detained. You, the international envoy, are in hiding at this very moment. Uh, where does your fight go from here? Well, these uh, military generals are the ones who have committed the crime against humanity, war crimes, ethnic cleansings, and genocides toward ethnic minorities for so many, many years. They include Kachin, Karin, Shan, Moon, Rakhine, Chins, the Rohingya brothers and sisters. So this is up to international community right now to stop these military generals from killing the people of Myanmar. Now, if there's no actions, strong and coordinated targeted action from international community, I'm afraid that my country will have to go through the greatest civil war that we have never seen before. The people of Myanmar are now in the situations where they are to do or to die. So that means that uh, we are there protesting every day, risking the life every day. And that means that uh, all the people, 54 million people of Myanmar are now risking their life every day so that we can restore democracy and the freedom and justice once for all. So this idea that the people are ready to die rather than to live under oppressive uh, circumstances raises another question, because so, so far we've been talking about civil disobedience. We've been talking about this idea that people will be willing to protest nonviolently. But the question for me is, are they willing to take up arms? Uh, you know, are they willing to engage in armed resistance? And would you support such uh, a decision if they did? We don't like to go down to that road of any form of violence. But the people of Myanmar are now being left with no choice because we have been waiting for diplomacy to work from international community. That means that they need to take stronger actions against these military regimes right now before it's too late. So the people of Myanmar will be forced to defend themselves. In the end of the day, we cannot die like a ship. We cannot be killed like a ship on the street of our own home, our own floor. That means that the people of Myanmar will be forced to defend themselves. In, in recent years, Myanmar has been a very interesting space with a kind of tightrope that you're walking, trying to uh, balance power between a military and a civilian government uh, and a kind of power sharing agreement led uh, by Aung San Suu Kyi and the military. But a source told The Wall Street Journal that Suu Kyi and General Halang uh, rarely met or communicated and that they didn't trust each other. Uh, given that relationship, uh, was the military reassuming power inevitable? Well, the military is, first we have to, we have to know, understand is, the military generals are the enemy of democracy. They are the enemy of freedom. They are enemy of justice. In their words, there's no justice, there's no democracy, there's no freedom. That's how they have ruled the country for five decades, continuously. Yeah. So this 2008 constitution that they created is by the military generals for the military generals. Just imagine that kind of power sharing. How do you work and maneuver 
that's surrounded by the guns, smoky guns, that they can take anytime they want the power from you. So it was tough. It was tough five years for our leader, our Sa Su Ji, for our party NLD. Of course, they can take the power anytime they want. That's what they just have done in the first of February. It was tough. It's a tough, tough choice. You, you talk about how challenging uh, the last few years, last five years, you say, uh, have been for uh, Aung San Suu Kyi. Uh, but for many people, the, the recent years have also witnessed a shift in her own either views or her actions. Uh, she was once seen as a global symbol of democracy. And now she's become a politician that many people see as aiding and abetting uh, human rights abuses, uh, possibly war crimes. She has defended military leaders that the U.N. said should be prosecuted for genocide, crimes against humanity, war crimes. What do you say to that? It's very simple. In that, uh, if, if you're working in her shoes, they can kill her anytime, if they want, yeah? And they will assassinate her anytime they want. And now they are killing so many people already, as the world watch. This is what the military has been for many, many years to uh, the people of Myanmar, yeah? Of course, I'm not saying that mistake has not been done. I say there's, uh, there's, there's some uh, terrible mistake have been, uh, may happen. But again, it's... Well, what, what are some know, of those mistakes again, that you would say uh, Aung San Suu Kyi has made with regard to human rights, war crimes, etc.? Where, where, where did she go wrong? I think uh, one the situation was that our situation was in that atmosphere when you cannot just exercise your freedom, when your freedom was taken away by smoky guns. So that means, of course, it was just a choice, not even a mistake, I would say. Of course, the mistake means the way how we handle could have been differently. Uh, you mentioned earlier that she could be killed at any moment. W was her failure to condemn the military's action or to understate the violence that was happening uh, done out of fear? Definitely. If there was, you know, there was such kind of uh, strong condemnation against the military regimes, of course, you know, she will be that moment. That That's the moment when uh, the, the military will stage a coup, declaring emergency. Just what they have done just a few weeks ago, last month. You know, now I am charged with high treason before I speak it for democracy and the freedom. Just imagine, just for speaking out, I do not kill anyone. Now they gave me uh, this, uh, you know, high treason charge uh, that carried that penalty. So that means that they went to me, they were, they went to kill me. Yeah, if I am in a country right now, they will kill me. That's very simple. There have been times where your leader has used language that was somewhat troublesome. She actively failed to condemn the violence against the Rohingya. Uh, that seems deeply troubling and, for many people, inexcusable. First of all, will you condemn the violence against them? Definitely, yes, 100 percent. Yes, 100 percent. It's not only to against Rohingya people. It has been like that to the Kachin people, Karen people, the Shan people. I belong to the Chin people, yeah? Our Chin ethnic minority has suffered terribly in the hand of this military regime for the last 70 years. The same for Green, the same for Chin, the same for Shan and Mon Rakhine, yeah? And the same for our brother, sister Rohingya. So we have been condemning for 70 years, but it's not just enough to condemn them. They have to go away. They have to be removed. Because but but condemning, condemning, them would be, condemning them would be a start. I, I appreciate you condemning them. Why, why didn't Aung San Suu Kyi? Well, in, in, uh, I mean, as I said again, her situation is different. 700,000 uh, were displaced from their homes. 10,000 people were killed. Uh, thousands of women and girls were raped, sexually assaulted. And about 400 villages were partly or wholly destroyed. Uh, you would agree uh, that... Aung San Suu Kyi uh, bears some responsibility for that extraordinary and awful violence, no? It's not Aung San Suu Kyi's fault. It is not Aung San Suu Kyi's order. It is the, the military commander-in-chief, General Ming Aulai. They should be investigated for their crime, yeah? They should be investigated. There should be international inquiry investigating these all military generals for their crimes. So this crime has been go just like that, without punishment. They but, but sir, I mean, here's just... what, Dr. Sasa, here's what I'm not following. 
she's the one who went to The Hague to defend this. She's the one who said that this stuff is f fake news. She dismissed uh, ethnic cleansing in, 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 in Rakhine as Muslims killing Muslims. The very thing you want the world to know about, she seems to be dismissing. How do you reconcile that? I cannot go back to the past. I'm only looking for the future. So the future that we are looking is uh, federal, democratic, free union of Myanmar, where everyone will have a future. No one should be left behind. Every crime that has been committed should be investigated, no matter who, no matter what. It has to be investigated. It happened with the Rohingya people, or it happened with the Shan, or the Kachin, or Karims. All the crime that has been taken place should be investigated. It prevents of that should will never happen again. Well, we'll have to leave it there. Dr. Sasa, thank you so much for joining me on Upfront. Thank you very much for having me. Despite making up close to 5% of the global population, the United States is home to nearly 25% of the world's prison population. So is it time to end mass incarceration? Upfront producer Ashish Malhotra has this week's reality check. Prison, a place none of us want to go, but where you kind of have to if you break the law. And hey, it's unpleasant, but we need to put away people who commit crime to protect us, right? Well, not really. Mass incarceration doesn't actually make us safer. In the United States, though crime has declined over the past few decades, that's been almost completely because of other factors, improved graduation rates, wages, and consumer confidence. Maybe the government should be focusing on those issues instead. But that's not happening. With over 2 million people in prison, the U.S. has the highest incarceration rate in the world at 639 people per 100,000. Compare that to Canada at 104, Germany at 69, or Japan at 38. And if every U.S. state were a country, El Salvador, which right now has the second highest rate of incarceration in the world, would drop to 32nd. But while many suffer at the hands of America's obsession with mass incarceration, it's big business for others. You may have heard of the military industrial complex, but how about the prison industrial complex? By 2017, the cost of locking people up in the U.S. ballooned to $182 billion, more than five times what it was in 2000. Part of that money goes to telecom companies who overcharge inmates for phone calls and health and food companies who profit off serving prisons as well. A big part of what sustains the prison industrial complex is also what people go to jail for. In 2016, almost half of U.S. state prisoners were there for nonviolent crimes. And more than a quarter are there for misdemeanors like minor parole violations, sitting on sidewalks, unpaid traffic tickets, and jaywalking. Really? Jaywalking? And with so many laws rooted in racism and slavery, black people make up 40% of people in prison, even though they only account for 13% of the population. And then there's the U.S.'s reliance on mandatory minimums and long prison terms. More than 200,000 people are facing life in jail in the U.S. That's more than 113 other countries combined. And the fact is, locking up all these people isn't even working. Research shows that a stint in prison can actually increase the likelihood of inmates reoffending. So what are the alternatives? Monitoring and controlling offenders outside prison is one way. It's being used successfully in Australia. In New York, alternative to incarceration programs have helped dramatically reduce the number of prisoners, while crime has also gone down. And in Norway, despite sentences being capped at 21 years, rates of violent crime and reoffending are both lower than in the US. But you might still say, hold on, what about survivors of violent crime? Shouldn't they have a say? Well, a 2016 survey showed nearly 70% of survivors wanted the people that hurt them to get community supervision or treatment rather than spend their days in jail. If they understand mass incarceration doesn't work, surely the rest of society can get on board too. Last weekend, Turkish President Recep Tayyip Erdogan issued a decree withdrawing the country from the landmark European treaty to prevent violence against women, the Istanbul Convention. 
According to women's rights groups, femicide, a hate crime where a woman is murdered on account of her gender, has tripled in Turkey over the last 10 years. Why now? And what will it mean for the safety of Turkish women? And given that gender-based violence has skyrocketed worldwide since the start of the coronavirus pandemic, is an international solution needed? Joining me from London to answer these questions is Elif Shafak, award-winning novelist and women's rights advocate. Elif Shafak, thank you so much for joining me on Upfront. Thank you. Last week, uh, President Erdogan announced that Turkey would be withdrawing from the Istanbul Convention. That, of course, is the international treaty to prevent violence against women and domestic violence. Uh, the World Health Organization estimates that 38 percent of women in Turkey are subjected to violence from their partner. Given these realities, why would Turkey withdraw? Well, the government is withdrawing from Istanbul Convention at a time when we need this convention the most, more than ever before, is quite alarming, to be honest. And I find this totally unacceptable, because as we're speaking, both uh, femicide and domestic violence in Turkey is at an alarming level. And instead of implementing the Istanbul Convention, which was signed in 2011 in Istanbul, hence the name, and since then has been signed by 45 countries. Turkey at the time was the first country to sign it. But now, instead of putting it into practice, instead of doing something to help the victims of violence, the government is doing the exact opposite. President Erdogan's Justice and Development Party, or the AKP, came to power in 2002. And since then, we have seen uh, a, a, a stunning rise in violence against women. Uh, we've seen, for example, from 66 uh, women murdered in 2002 to 953 in the first half of 2009. Uh, after that, the government simply stopped releasing data on femicide. Uh, women's rights groups say nearly 100 have been killed so far this year. Uh, why has gender-based violence increased so much under Edouard's leadership? So the government does not um, release the numbers, but women's rights organizations have been doing their best to, to understand the extent of this tragedy, of this human rights crisis that we are going through. And we do know that the real numbers are much, much higher because there are so many honor killings, and I use honor killings, quote unquote, because there's no honor in these killings. There are some very suspicious suicides, and there are many, many stories we never hear about. This is an emergency for us. So the fact that the government is not supporting this and doing the exact opposite, to me, is just, just unthinkable. One of the things you're pointing to is the timing of this. Obviously, withdrawing has its own consequences whenever. But the timing of this seems particularly curious. Uh, the Turkish government right now is under fire for the case against Melek uh, Ipek, who uh, killed her husband after he tortured and sexually assaulted her and threatened to kill her daughters. The prosecution is calling for life in prison, describing her husband as a family man. EPEC went on trial less than a week before this decision to withdraw from the treaty. Is this a coincidence? Is this some sort of political strategy we should be thinking through? What's going on here? We do know that if the Istanbul Convention had been implemented, because it's not enough to sign a treaty, you need to put it into practice. If this had been done, hundreds and thousands of women whom we are mourning right now, those women would be alive. The case of Melek Ipek is, is, is just uh, unbelievable. The things that this woman has endured through, throughout her marriage, more than a decade of abuse and violence. And on that particular night, she was assaulted, sexually assaulted. She was stripped naked, tortured, beaten, and threatened with death in front of her young children by her husband. As a self-defense, she killed her husband, and now her case is very important for us. But as you pointed out, one of the many problems that we have in Turkey is, in the courtroom, the system, the judi judicial system, almost always favors the men, the perpetrators. We had another case in which uh, a killer um, who had been just released from prison due to COVID, Meanwhile, of course, you need to bear in mind that there are many intellectuals, journalists in prison in Turkey who are not released because of COVID, but these people are. So he was released. He went home. He killed his wife, who was trying to get a divorce. And as he was arrested, there was a group of men on the street applauding him, 
applauding him and praising him for being the king of men. So there's a lot that we need to question in Turkey. And you cannot say that if we just leave it to traditions, to family traditions, this will be solved on its own. It won't be. We need a proper international treaty to solve this urgent crisis. Well, I mean, you talk about the need for a proper international treaty, and you also talk about uh, the appeal by the ruling party, by the AKP, but also by others in, in, in the Turkish society, and indeed around the world, uh, to honor and values and some of these big picture ideas that are deeply uh, troublesome to many, particularly feminists. Uh, the Istanbul Convention, for example, has been criticized by the AKP for challenging or contradicting traditional family values. President Erdogan has railed against birth control, saying that it'll lead uh, the Turkish uh, society to extinction. He's talked about women uh, who don't spend their time in the home as, quote, deficient and incomplete. Uh, the U.N. has warned that this concept of family values in particular is not an innocent idea, that it can undermine the rights of women and children. How do conservatives, again, not just in Turkey, but really around the globe, reconcile these ideas, these so-called values around family, with what we clearly can see are the limiting of women's rights? Absolutely. Um, as you pointed out, this is a president who repeatedly said that he doesn't believe in gender equality. That's where we start. But as you also rightly pointed out, it's not only happening in Turkey. We're seeing similar discussions in Hungary, in Poland, from time to time in Brazil, uh, time to time in Italy. And it's not a coincidence that wherever, whenever we see countries sliding into some kind of populism, or populist authoritarianism, whenever we see a rise in ultranationalism and religious fundamentalism, we will also see a rise in sexism. We will also see a rise in misogyny and homophobia. These things always go hand in hand. This is not a coincidence. That is why I think when countries lose their democracy and when countries lose their appreciation for diversity, we women and minorities, we have much more to lose, because the first rights that will be curbed will be women's rights and minority rights. Women's rights groups say that gender-based violence in Turkey has only gotten worse during the coronavirus pandemic, but it's not just Turkey. Uh, when the pandemic began, incidents of domestic violence increased by 300 percent in Ubay, China, 25 percent in Argentina, 30 percent in, in Cyprus, 33 percent in Singapore and 50 percent in Brazil. Uh, it's been called a kind of pandemic within a COVID-19 pandemic. But why is the home, the domestic sphere, such an unsafe place for women around the world? I think we need to talk about how universal this is and how urgent this is. Of course, the pandemic did not create this problem, but I think it exposed the existing fractures in our societies and inequalities. We need to talk about male violence and stop using a more passive language and stop uh, speaking as if this is women's problem. If men also do not engage in this conversation, we cannot move forward. Of course, in a patriarchal system, women are unhappy. They're not free. But I also think men are unhappy. Men are deeply, deeply unhappy, especially young men who do not conform to the given description of masculinity. Their lives are very difficult as well. There is a particular type of masculinity that is constantly being idolized and imposed on people as the only form of manhood. We need to challenge that together. And throughout well, what the does pandemic... That, what, does that, what does that look like, though? How do we challenge what some would call a toxic masculinity uh, in a space where popular culture, religion, uh, tradition, uh, all normalize these unhealthy forms of male domination, of violence, of patriarchy, of rape culture. How do we begin to uproot that stuff and replace it with something more healthy and humanizing? I think, first of all, we need to be very careful about binary oppositions, where, which are constantly being produced by populist movements. So populists all across the world, they make it sound as if the feminist movement or, or movement, movements for equality are a threat for traditional family values or family values in general. We need to move beyond these dualities. A house in which there is constant systematic violence is an extremely unhappy place. Women are unhappy there, men are unhappy there, children are unhappy there. And of course, we don't want that kind of family. And of course, we don't want those kinds of values. 
Um, I find it very important that men also start to engage in these conversations because they hear things, you know, in their daily life, the jokes, the words, words matter. Oftentimes, lots of things start with words and then things get serious. So to warn each other, to speak up, to speak out without getting defensive, I think it's extremely important. Elif Shafak, thank you so much for joining us in Upfront. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. All right, that's our show. Upfront, we'll be back next week.